Hey, it's time to start making plans to attend the premier true crime event of the year, CrimeCon UK. CrimeCon is the world's number one true crime event, and if you're fascinated by all things true crime, you won't want to miss it. CrimeCon UK will be held on June 10th and 11th at the Leonardo Royal Hotel Tower Bridge in London. What is CrimeCon? CrimeCon is part education, part advocacy, part discovery, and 100% fun when you attend with your true crime obsessed friends. Don't have true crime obsessed friends or family? No problem. You'll find your tribe at CrimeCon UK. Attendees say that CrimeCon was not only the best weekend of their entire year, but they left with a great experience and new friends. Over CrimeCon weekend, you'll get up close and personal with true crime experts, learn from advocates for justice, and rub elbows with true crime stars and celebs, like documentary filmmakers, investigators, and podcasters involved with some of the most talked about true crime cases today. In the breakout sessions, you will delve deeper into cases and hear real life stories directly from survivors and victims' families. And you won't want to miss one of the most popular features of CrimeCon, Podcast Row, where you'll meet all your favorite true crime podcasters and YouTubers from around the world. I'll be there again to meet you all, and I can't wait. So get your tickets today and mark your calendars for June 10th and 11th in London. Go to crimecon.co.uk to get more information and register. Use my offer code once upon for discounted tickets. CrimeCon UK, the ultimate true crime event. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Those of you who are regular listeners of Once Upon a Crime know that I'm particularly fascinated by women who commit the most heinous crimes. Statistically, women constitute a much smaller percentage of those who commit violent crimes. The death penalty is reserved for only the worst of the worst offenders in the United States. Between 1973 and 1992, only 186 death sentences, or just 2%, have been imposed upon women. If a woman receives a death sentence, you can bet that her crime is considered extreme, particularly violent, or in some way breaks gender norms. In this month's series, I'll be sharing stories about a few of these women to learn about their crimes, discover what made them kill, and determine what factors influenced the jury's decision to send them to death row. First up, I'll share a story of the youngest woman to be sentenced to death in the U.S. in modern times. Consumed with jealousy and rage toward a perceived romantic rival, a teen obsession turns deadly and results in a gruesome and shocking murder. This is the story of Krista Pike. In September 1994, Colleen Ann Slemmer was excited. The 19-year-old was about to start a new chapter in her life in Tennessee. Born in Jacksonville, Florida on September 20, 1975, Colleen had grown up with her mother, May, with whom she was extremely close, and a stepfather and sister. Her biological father resided in another state. Colleen had honey blonde hair, a heart-shaped face, and blue eyes, and was described by those who knew her as a lively, enthusiastic, and pretty girl. Colleen had struggled in school due to a learning disability, which resulted in her dropping out of the ninth grade. But while not the best student, Colleen wasn't lazy. After leaving high school, she worked two jobs at Taco Bell and Wendy's, both fast food franchises. But Colleen wanted more out of life, and by 1994 had decided to enroll in the Job Corps program to further her education and skills. Job Corps is a government-funded residential career training program administered by the Department of Labor with campuses nationwide. Operating for over 50 years, it offers free education and vocational training to young people between the ages of 16 to 24. Students can complete their high school education, receive vocational training, and be assisted in job placement. Job Corps also provides on-campus dorm-style accommodations for students who need it while they complete the program. After graduation, students can pursue higher education, enter the workforce, or may consider a career in the military. 
Realizing she didn't want to work in fast food for the rest of her life, Colleen learned about the program and spoke with a recruiter for the Jacksonville campus of Job Corps. Colleen set her goals to complete her high school coursework, obtain her General Equivalency Diploma, or GED, and study computing. Unfortunately, the Jacksonville campus didn't offer the course Colleen was interested in, and her family couldn't afford to pay for private college tuition. So it was decided that Colleen would move out of state to attend the program at the Knoxville campus in Tennessee. Her mother, May, was understandably worried about her daughter being so far away from home without friends or family, but Colleen knew that this was the right step toward her future. She promised her mother she'd only be gone for six months and would be back home the following spring. Like Colleen, other students in Knoxville were focused on pursuing their education and training as well, including 18-year-old Krista Pike and her boyfriend, 17-year-old Tatterell Ship. The couple stood out among other students on campus, both in their manner of dress and their interests. Krista and Tatterell were known for their shared interest in Satanism, and they sported black clothing and piercings, and wore symbols identifying them as Satanists. Tatterell kept books on the occult and items in his dorm room used for satanic rituals. The pair exchanged pentagram pendants, and Krista gave herself the nickname Little Devil. The couple met soon after arriving at Job Corps when Krista was homesick. She'd noticed Tatterell right away. One day, when Krista was feeling especially lost and overwhelmed, Tatterell approached her and gave her a shoulder to lean on. From that day on, Tatterell became her hero, and he was equally smitten. Krista had never felt so strongly for anyone. She felt deep inside that Tatterell was her soulmate, and the pair became inseparable. Both had been raised by grandparents and suffered the loss of one of them when they died. Tatterell, his grandfather, and Krista, her grandmother, the only person she ever felt loved and safe with. Tatterell was raised in a stable home, but Krista had a rough upbringing with little stability. She quickly became dependent on Tatterell as a source of love and support. This attachment was an unhealthy one. Krista became jealous and possessive of her boyfriend, and Tatterell was controlling and manipulative towards Krista. Both had hair-trigger tempers and a tendency to fly off the handle. The couple's fierce arguments sometimes resulted in physical altercations, where each of them in turn acted as the instigator. Unable to see these dynamics for what they were, the young couple mistook this passion and conflict for love. At the same time, Krista idolized Tatterell and hung on his every word. She hadn't experienced a positive male role model and liked the idea of Tatterell protecting her from the big bad world. Krista had always been the one who'd had the responsibility to protect herself and others around her. For the first time, she could rest in the knowledge that someone was looking out for her. In an interview later, she said of Tatterell, somebody finally cares about me like I care about other people. If their relationship was volatile, Krista was willing to tolerate this for what he provided in her life. Tatterell backed up his promise to look out for Krista with action. When another student accidentally bumped into Krista one day without apologizing, Tatterell grabbed him by the throat, shoved him up against the wall, and threatened him with a blade. According to Krista, Tatterell threatened the frightened student, saying that if he so much breathed on Krista again, he'd cut his throat. While this over-the-top display might scare most young women away, it proved to Krista that Tatterell would never let anyone hurt her. It wasn't until much later that Krista realized her boyfriend's behavior wasn't reasonable or healthy. Not long after Colleen Slemmer arrived on campus, Krista became convinced that the pretty blonde had developed a crush on Tatterell. We don't know why Krista believed this. Perhaps it was nothing more than idle gossip, something the campus rumor mill generated and nothing more. But Krista took it to heart and couldn't let it go. As 1994 drew to a close, Krista saw Colleen as a major threat to her relationship with Tatterell and became consumed with thoughts of revenge against her fellow student. Determined to put Colleen in her place, Krista started nasty rumors about her and tried to goad her into a physical altercation. This couldn't have come at a worse time for Colleen, who was trying to navigate a new environment far from home. In one phone call to her mother, May, Colleen said she didn't like the campus environment and found it depressing. She also confided in her mother that three students were stalking her. She reported that they came into her room uninvited, threatened her, and stole things. Colleen never mentioned the students by name, but she did tell May that one of them even came into her room and brandished a knife. Colleen said that this girl thought Colleen was after her boyfriend, which Colleen insisted wasn't true. 
New Year's Day 1995 came and went, but Krista remained fixated on how to make Colleen pay. On Wednesday, January 11th, Krista divulged to a fellow student, Kim Ololio, that she was planning to kill Colleen because, quote, she just felt mean that day. The following day, Thursday, January 12th, Colleen called her mother, May, and they spoke briefly. Before hanging up the phone, Colleen told her mother that she was going to a local blockbuster video store to rent a movie. She ended the call saying, Not much longer till I see you. Gotta go. I love you, Mom. Bye. What Colleen didn't say was that she wasn't going alone. Krista Pike had invited her early that day, asking her if she wanted to meet at Blockbuster to rent a video to watch together that evening. While this surprised Colleen, she accepted Krista's offer, daring to hope it was an olive branch of sorts. Krista's friend and dorm mate, Kim, saw Krista walking away from the Job Corps Center and towards 17th Street with her boyfriend, Tatterall Ship, and another Job Corps student, 18-year-old Shadola Peterson, about 8 p.m. When Krista arrived to meet Colleen, she was surprised to also see Ship and Shadola Peterson with her. As the group made their way to the store, Krista told Colleen she had a bag of marijuana hidden in nearby Tyson Park. Chatty and engaging, Krista insisted Colleen take a detour with them to hang out and smoke weed together. This wasn't what she expected, but Colleen was eager to end the tension between her and Krista. It would make life at school much easier, so she agreed. Colleen followed the trio to a secluded spot near the University of Tennessee campus. But instead of pulling out the bag of pot, Krista's demeanor changed instantly. She turned on Colleen, accusing her of trying to steal Tatterall and, quote, get her in trouble with senior Job Corps staff. Krista and Colleen became engaged in a heated argument. Becoming more angry as Colleen denied her accusations, Krista grabbed her by the hair and kneed her in the face, making contact with her cheek multiple times. An enraged Krista then threw her nemesis to the ground. She kicked her repeatedly before slamming her head against the concrete. A terrified Colleen repeatedly begged between sobs, why are you doing this to me? Colleen fought back as best she could, threatening to report Krista and get her kicked out of Job Corps. Krista responded by again kicking Colleen in the face and side. The distressed young woman lay on the ground distraught before staggering to her feet and attempting to flee. She knew she had to get away. Everything had gone so terribly wrong. All she wanted to do was get back to campus. But Tatterall was too fast for her. Pursuing Colleen, he caught her and pushed her to the ground. Surrounded by the group now, Colleen did as they demanded and removed her shirt and bra, as her captors felt that being half naked would stop her from running away. Krista and Tatterall held a writhing Colleen down on the ground until she stopped struggling. Krista then pulled out a box cutter concealed in her clothing and a miniature meat cleaver she'd borrowed from someone on campus. After dragging their victim to another area, Krista removed the box cutter and sliced Colleen's stomach. The petrified young woman screamed in agony before rolling over and again scrambling to her feet. Colleen's escape attempts became more futile as she grew weaker. Krista continued the assault and sliced Colleen with the meat cleaver along her back. Desperate now, Colleen tried reasoning with her attackers, pleading with Krista that if she let her go, she'd walk straight home to Florida without so much as a backward glance. Krista's response was to tell Colleen to shut up. Every time Colleen spoke, Krista reacted by kicking her in the face. She finally removed a cloth from her hair and tied it around Colleen's mouth as a gag. But as suddenly as the attack began, Krista abruptly ended the assault. She told everyone to be quiet, saying she thought she heard someone approaching. She left Tatterall and Shadola to watch over Colleen and walked a short distance into the tree line that ringed the woods just beyond the campus. When she was satisfied there was no one around, she returned. This had given Colleen a brief reprieve, but the attack now continued. Krista began cutting Colleen's throat with the box cutter while she continued to beg for her life. When she again tried to escape, a furious Krista picked up a large piece of broken asphalt and raised it above her victim, striking Colleen hard in the back of the head. Colleen fell to the ground. Grabbing the chunk of asphalt, Krista continued the frenzied attack. She rained multiple blows upon Colleen's head, repeatedly asking, Do you know who's doing this to you? Colleen could no longer speak or fight back. 
She'd suffered stab wounds, a fractured skull, and contusions, and was bleeding profusely. When Colleen stopped moving, Krista and Tatterall dragged her body by the feet and dumped it in a nearby pile of dirt and leaves. The couple washed their hands and shoes in a mud puddle before discarding the box cutter. They returned to the campus, and Krista returned the miniature meat cleaver to the person she'd borrowed it from. They both then returned to their dorms like nothing had happened at all. Around 10.15 p.m. the night of the attack, Kim saw Krista, Tadrell, and Shadola Peterson returning to campus. She noted that Colleen, who Krista said they had gone to meet, hadn't returned with them. Kim remembered Krista's threats to kill her and wondered. Maybe Krista was just exaggerating. Maybe she was just trying to act tough, Kim thought. Surely she wasn't serious. It wouldn't be long before her questions were answered. Later that evening, Krista entered Kim's room in an excited state. She proudly told the stunned girl that she had killed Colleen, and she had brought back a piece of the victim's skull as a souvenir. With Kim in utter shock and disbelief, Krista pulled out a bloody piece of bone. She boasted that she'd savagely beaten Colleen and described how she'd cut her with a meat cleaver, slashed her throat, and beat her with a chunk of asphalt, quote, splitting her head open, end quote. Krista's eyes lit up as she explained to Kim how Colleen had begged for her life. Kim later reported that Krista gleefully recalled the gruesome details, giddy and dancing in a circle, unable to wipe the smile off her face. She ended the conversation by revealing to Kim that she'd carved a pentagram into Colleen's forehead and chest. Kim didn't report what she'd heard, not quite believing if it was true. But the next morning at breakfast, she approached Krista in the cafeteria and asked what she'd done with the piece of Colleen's skull. Krista calmly told Kim it was in her pocket, saying, Yeah, I'm eating breakfast with it. That same morning in class, Krista repeated what she'd told Kim to another student, Stephanie Wilson. Pointing to brown stains on her shoes, Krista said, That ain't mud on my shoes, that's blood. As Stephanie tried to make sense of what Krista was saying, Krista pulled a napkin from her pocket and showed Stephanie a piece of bone, which she said was a piece of Colleen's skull. Krista now added more gruesome details of the attack, telling Stephanie that Colleen's blood and brain matter had been, quote, pouring out. Like Kim, Stephanie didn't know what to think. Neither girl reported what Krista had told them. Apartments.com has helped millions of renters find their perfect places. And the beauty is, they're all different. None of us are the same, so why should our homes be? Some may want hardwood floors. Someone else may say, carpet all the way. Questionable call, but hey, you do you. Personally, I won't even look at a place if it isn't pet friendly. You all know how much my pups mean to me. You might even hear one right behind me snoring. <laughs> Apartments.com has all the right tools to help you find the place that's uniquely perfect for you. Sort through and filter listings by amenities and make sure you never miss out with their instant alert option. With more than 1 million available units for rent, you're sure to find the place that's right for you. So whether you're looking for a place with a basement, a yard, pet friendly, or everything in between, Apartments.com has got you covered. Visit Apartments.com, the place to find a place. At 8.05 a.m., while Krista was calmly eating breakfast and showing Kim the macabre crime scene souvenir, the brutalized body of a young woman was found lying near the agricultural department greenhouses on the grounds of the University of Tennessee. Officer Terry Johnson from the University of Tennessee Police Department was the first on the scene. The body was covered in blood and dirt and was found laying face down in a pile of leaves and twigs. Stripped of clothing from the waist up and clad only jeans, socks, and shoes, the victim had been viciously bludgeoned about the head and had multiple slashing injuries to her torso. The face was so badly mutilated that Officer Johnson had difficulty determining that it was a human face. Homicide detectives and crime scene technicians were called to the scene. When the body was turned over and examined, officers discovered the victim's throat had been slashed and a bloody rag hung loose around the neck. 
As the scene was being processed, blood footprints and broken foliage covered an expansive area 100 by 60 feet. Trampled bushes, hand and knee prints in the mud, and drag marks all pointed to evidence of a struggle. 30 feet from the victim's body was a large pool of blood. The autopsy revealed that the young woman had suffered a terrible and torturous ordeal at the hands of her killer or killers. She sustained so many cuts and slashing injuries to her torso that the medical examiner eventually had to catalog only the most serious and major wounds. After the body was cleaned, a pentagram symbol could be seen carved into the victim's chest. In addition to slashing wounds to her face, back, arms, and abdomen, she also had defensive wounds on her right arm. Contusions on her knees indicated fresh bruising consistent with crawling. Eleven slash injuries to her throat included a horrific gaping wound six inches long. The cause of death was determined as blunt force injuries to the head, resulting in multiple and extensive skull fractures. Small divots in the victim's skull contained black asphalt particles, suggesting a chunk of rock could have been the murder weapon. The young woman was alive not only when her injuries were inflicted, but possibly conscious throughout the entire nightmarish ordeal, the medical examiner concluded. She was soon identified through dental records as 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer. Law enforcement wasted no time interviewing Colleen's classmates and staff at the Job Corps Center and almost immediately learned that a fellow student, Krista Pike, had bragged about murdering Colleen and had been one of the last people she was seen with. On Saturday, January 14th, just 36 hours after the slaying, Krista and Tatterall were brought in separately for questioning by Detective Randy York of the Knoxville Police Department. Even though Krista was still a student, as an 18-year-old, she was legally an adult, so could make her own decisions about whether to speak with officers. Detective York began the interview, as he always did, by reading the suspect her Miranda rights. To his great surprise, Krista said she wanted to waive her rights and volunteered to make a statement. She launched into a full and detailed confession. She didn't hesitate to place the blame on Colleen, making herself out as the victim of a crime of provocation. Krista stated that one night before the murder, she awoke, terrified, to find Colleen standing over her holding a box cutter. She then went on to say she never planned to kill Colleen. She claimed her only intention was to fight the young woman so she would, quote, leave me the hell alone. Krista described how during the attack, She'd heard voices instructing her to kill Colleen to stop her from reporting her for attempted murder. Krista was calculated in her retelling. Wanting to protect her boyfriend, who she knew was being interrogated in the next room, she didn't name Tadrell specifically. Instead, she simply referred to someone else as hitting Colleen in the head with a piece of asphalt and carving the pentagram into her chest. She told Detective York that the blood-stained jeans she'd worn during the murder were still in her room explaining she'd rubbed mud onto them to conceal the bloodstains. During her confession, Krista added that following the murder, she discarded Colleen's identification and a pair of black gloves into a trash can at a Texaco gas station on Cumberland Avenue. All in all, Krista's shocking confession came to 46 pages. She agreed to accompany Detective York to the Job Corps campus, where he searched her room. Afterward, officers went with Krista as she retraced her steps. Along the way, she narrated how the attack unfolded on the night of the murder in detail. Krista Pike was charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. If she pleaded not guilty and was convicted, she faced the possibility of the death penalty being imposed. By now, word that Krista was in custody accused of murder spread like wildfire across campus. Upon getting wind of the news, Job Corps Orientation Specialist Robert Pollock contacted the police after returning to work on Tuesday, January 17th. He said that Krista had left a jacket in his office the previous Friday afternoon. When the jacket was handed over to the police for further examination, a small piece of bone was found in one of the pockets. The bone fragment was sent to a forensic anthropologist at the University of Tennessee, who worked with the medical examiner to reconstruct Colleen's skull. The fragment recovered from Krista's jacket matched the missing piece exactly. By this stage, thanks to the forensic evidence, 
Detective York and his investigators had determined Tatterall's ship was heavily involved despite Krista's futile attempts to cover for him during her initial interview. Shadola Peterson was also identified as an accomplice. Law enforcement and the public alike were appalled, not just by the viciousness of the attack, but by the pettiness of the motivation. The prevailing sentiment that most shocked the community was that someone so young and female was the primary instigator of something so incredibly violent. Taking the mob mentality of Tatterall Ship and Shadola Peterson's involvement into account, the public demanded to know how this could happen. They wanted to understand what could lead a young woman to do something so monstrous. Even before she was born on March 10, 1976 in Durham, North Carolina, Krista Gale Pike was battling the odds. Daughter to Glenn Pike and Carissa Hansen, Krista was born prematurely and almost immediately placed in the care of her maternal grandmother. Throughout her childhood, she frequently moved back and forth between her mother's side of the family and her father, Glenn, who moved to West Virginia after remarrying. Glenn Pike was in his daughter's life, but he had no interest in raising her. Krista's mother, Carissa, was a high-functioning alcoholic who made it to work every day between binge drinking and drugging. Her alcohol use had been so heavy during her pregnancy that Krista was born with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and organic brain damage resulting from malformation of the brain in the womb. Krista was cared for by her maternal grandmother during her first few formative years. According to Krista's aunt, Carrie Ross, the grandmother didn't provide baby Krista with a loving and secure home environment. She was not much better off than she would have been in her mother's care, her aunt said. Krista's grandmother was also an alcoholic who verbally abused the child from a young age. It was also suspected that Krista may have been sexually abused by her grandmother's boyfriend beginning around the age of two. Despite her alcoholism, Krista's mother never missed a day of work as a nurse at a local hospital. She often took Krista to work with her, and the young girl one day dreamed of working in health care just like her mother. She knew all about hospitals. Doctor visits featured prominently in the young girl's life due to a genetic condition that caused Krista to have constant nosebleeds. No matter with whom Krista resided, she was subjected to verbal, emotional, and physical abuse from family members and others. In an interview with the cable news program 2020, she later said of her home environment, quote, There was an aura of fear. I was a very fearful child because of the people in my life. Her father, maternal grandmother, and her mother's boyfriends regularly beat Krista from a young age. Only one of Carissa's boyfriends who punched Krista in the face was ever charged with assault. Krista later stated that despite the beatings she received from her father, she truly believed he loved her, but simply wasn't equipped to be a parent. According to Dr. Jonathan Pincus, professor of neurology at Georgetown University, the constant hypervigilance Krista adopted as a defense mechanism while living in an unstable and abusive home environment resulted in her exhibiting symptoms of bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, although these conditions wouldn't be diagnosed until much later. When Krista was just nine years old, she was again victimized, this time by a neighbor who sexually abused her. To cope with the emotional pain and anguish, Krista began self-harming by cutting herself. She also showed signs of a behavioral disturbance acting out angrily and rebelling against authority figures. Krista's mother now described her daughter as out of control. Despite the upheaval and dysfunction in her home life, one of the few joys in 10-year-old Krista's life was reading to hospital patients when she accompanied her mother to work. She helped feed them at mealtimes and even painted their nails. When she wasn't acting out, she loved nothing more than spending as much free time at the hospital as she could. In 1989, when Krista was around 13 years old, her father Glenn kicked her out of his house for good, labeling his daughter disobedient, dishonest, and manipulative. The catalyst for this incident was an allegation that Krista had sexually abused her two-year-old half-sister from Glenn's second marriage. Krista later denied this, claiming her stepmother was behind this allegation because she wanted her stepdaughter out of the house permanently. Around the same time Krista was rejected by her father, she suffered another profound loss. Apart from going to see patients in the hospital, the only other ray of light in Krista's young life was her paternal grandmother. 
She was the only person in the family who Krista felt treated her with any kindness or love. Her grief and fear over who would now love and protect her after her grandmother's passing was so overwhelming that Krista attempted suicide by overdose. By now, she was living with her mother, Carissa, once more. With little idea of how to bond with her daughter in a healthy way, Carissa introduced her 13-year-old daughter to marijuana as an activity they could share. She also looked the other way when Krista began drinking as well. Her mother would defend her decision by saying that if she forbade Krista from drinking, she'd do it somewhere she wasn't safe. Given the day-to-day -day trauma and abuse that she suffered in her childhood, it was no surprise when Krista later stated, quote, I was probably a half-alcoholic by the time I was eight years old. Krista's substance abuse continued to spiral, and she also began using inhalants. She was sexually abused again, this time by one of her mother's boyfriends. Child Protective Services removed Krista from the home, but she was returned to her mother's care three months later. CPS records don't reflect subsequent attempts to monitor Krista's safety. Her new strategy to escape her volatile home life was to run away regularly. Krista was labeled a chronic runaway and placed in a group home for three months. One of her favorite places to find respite was the beach. She would sometimes walk for over an hour to get there. The only thing she said that soothed her was falling asleep on the soft sand with the sound of the ocean waves in the background. Her bipolar disorder symptoms often meant she was awake for days, unable to sleep, before she'd eventually crash and could not be roused for several days. To stop her daughter from running away, Krista's mother allowed her 14-year-old boyfriend to move in with them, even though the teen relationship was a physically abusive one. In one instance, her boyfriend assaulted her, and Krista came after him with a butcher knife. Completely disengaged academically, she dropped out of high school and began shoplifting. On probation for truancy and running away, she was eventually sent to a juvenile detention center for a month after she and her friends broke into a Little League baseball concession stand to steal food. It's ironic and tragic that juvenile detention was where Krista finally felt she had the stability and routine she'd lacked her entire childhood. She was so anxious about leaving the facility that she sabotaged her release date, acting out just before being discharged. The result was that she was sentenced to another 15 months of detention. Following her release at age 16, she was intent on making a career in healthcare. Krista began working as a recreation assistant where her mother was employed. However, she continued to struggle emotionally. The following year, the 17-year-old was raped by a stranger. Hospital records document the attack, but there was almost no follow-up by the authorities. By her 18th birthday, she had been raped twice and had a prolonged history of physical abuse inflicted by at least seven family members. She was tired of going from job to job and hated feeling like she was being forced into doing things she didn't want to do. But when a Job Corps recruiter recommended she enroll in the program to obtain her GED and work towards her goal of becoming a neonatal physical therapist, Krista reconsidered. In 1994, she moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, and began classes alongside Tatterall Ship and Colleen Slemmer. Eighteen-year-old Krista Pike was charged with premeditated first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder of Colleen Slemmer. The prosecutors were trying the case as a capital offense, which could result in the teenager receiving the death penalty if convicted. Considering Krista's deeply troubled history, the defense's psychological evaluation would be key in saving her from the death penalty. In a pretrial assessment, clinical psychologist Dr. Eric Ingham noted that the confluence of Krista's history of brain damage, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, neglect, substance abuse, and her undiagnosed and untreated mental illness created the, quote, perfect storm for Krista to unleash an extreme level of violence. In his report, Dr. Engum observed that Krista, quote, by the time she was born, began developing the capacity to kill, end quote. The doctor's assessment also put a label to Krista's behavior. It diagnosed her with borderline personality disorder, a mental health condition characterized by poor impulse control, unstable self-image veering between despair and self-aggrandizement, poor relationship and boundary setting skills, and difficulty forming and maintaining healthy relationships. The forensic evidence, largely supported by Krista's confession, was damning. The court heard that police retrieved Colleen's black gloves and identification cards from a trash can outside a gas station, as Krista had said. 
Blood samples taken from the clothing worn by Krista and Tatterall's ship on the night of the murder were a match for Colleen's DNA. Investigators testified that Krista recounted in great detail her actions and feelings during the attack upon Colleen Slemmer, saying that the more the victim pleaded for her life, the angrier she became. Regarding premeditation, the prosecution pointed to Krista's admission that she stopped the attack to briefly investigate whether someone was approaching. They argued that this proved Krista was capable of rational thought, action, and self-control during the crime, yet she chose to return and finish beating Colleen to death. A clinician testifying for the prosecution rejected the premise that Krista had evidence of brain damage. He further told the court that psychological testing revealed Krista had an IQ of 111 and was very bright. Her complete and utter lack of remorse following the crime was even more damaging to Krista's case. Following her arrest, she wrote a letter to Tatterall stating, Please write me. I miss you so much. You see what I get for trying to be nice to the hoe? I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she'd die quickly instead of letting her bleed to death and suffer more. And they fucking fry me. Isn't that some shit? Please write me and tell me what you're feeling. Also tell your lawyer if he wants me to testify you. I will. Love you for the rest of my life. And she signed it, Little Devil. The nature of Krista's confessions to other students, including Kim and Stephanie, failed to paint her in the sympathetic light the defense hoped for. Krista's attorneys argued that there was clear evidence their client had three features common in those who kill. Brain damage, a history of prolonged and serious abuse and neglect, and mental illness. They said that Krista met all these criteria and that her mental illness had never been diagnosed, so went untreated. Krista's aunt testified about the abuse suffered by her niece as a child. Her father, Glenn, told the court that his daughter's behavior had been problematic early on and described her as out of control from a young age. By the time she arrived at the Job Corps campus, the defense argued, Krista was ripe for manipulation by her peers, especially Tatterall Ship, who had his own behavioral and anger control issues. The defense claimed that Colleen had been harassing Krista and not the other way around. This caused Krista to feel targeted and unsafe, they countered. Grappling with undiagnosed bipolar disorder as well as untreated PTSD, Krista had poor problem-solving skills. They contended that her threatening behavior was all bluster, and she had only wanted to scare her victim. The presence of Tatterall Ship and Shadola Peterson egged her on to continue the violence. The defense told the court that what was meant to just frighten someone soon got out of hand with tragic consequences. After deliberating for only two and a half hours, the jury returned with their verdict. On both counts, Krista was found guilty. On March 30, 1996, she was sentenced to die by electrocution. The jury decided that the aggravating circumstances of the crime outweighed the mitigating circumstances of Krista's background and resulting psychological issues. At sentencing, the judge stated that Krista Pike's actions in the murder of Colleen Slemmer were, quote, especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel, in that it involved torture or serious physical abuse beyond that necessary to produce death, and that it was committed for the purpose of avoiding, interfering with, or preventing arrest or prosecution of those responsible. Krista was also sentenced to an additional 25 years on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder. Tatterall Ship was tried and convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Because he was 17 years old at the time of the murder and legally a juvenile, Ship was not eligible for the death penalty. Now 43 years old, Ship is serving his sentence at the Northwest Correctional Complex in Tiptonville, Tennessee. According to state records, he'll be eligible for parole in 2028 when he is 48. Shadola Peterson turned state's evidence, and in exchange for her testimony against Ship and Pike, she was allowed to plead guilty to accessory after the fact. She was sentenced to six years probation. Like all convicted felons sentenced to death in Tennessee, Krista Pike was automatically entitled to an appeal. The outcome of the punishment phase of the trial made history. Only 20 years old and not even of legal drinking age, Krista was the youngest woman sentenced to death in the U.S. since 1972. As part of her appeal, which again focused on her mental illness, history of abuse, and brain damage, another psychological assessment was required. 
This time it was conducted by neurologist Dr. Jonathan Pincus and forensic psychiatrist Dr. William Keller. In 2001, Dr. Pincus concluded that Krista exhibited the three features common to other convicted killers he'd forensically examined. He concluded that not only did he find evidence of brain damage in Krista Pike, but the damage was located in her brain's frontal lobe. He explained that anomalies to this brain area correlated with the lack of impulse control, poor reasoning skills, and a tendency towards violent behavior. Dr. Pincus attributed the impairment of Krista's frontal lobes to her mother's heavy drinking during her pregnancy. More information was shared with the court regarding detrimental factors experienced by Krista Pike during her formative years. The psychiatrist's report now included information about Krista's exposure to graphic images of sex and violence as a young child. She had accompanied her grandfather to his job at a slaughterhouse, where she witnessed cattle being butchered and processed. At home, there was no respite from such images that might also emotionally scar a child. She reported being exposed to graphic horror films as well as pornographic videos in her childhood home when she was still preschool age. The court rejected the appeal, stating that another clinician who testified for the defense at trial failed to find any evidence of brain impairment. The judge also ruled that much of the testimony regarding Pike's history of abuse had already been heard at the original trial. As no new evidence had been put forth, the appeals court ruled that a retrial would not be granted. First in 2001 and again in 2002, Krista Pike requested that her automatic appeals be dropped and her execution be scheduled. The 25-year-old's execution date was first set for August 2002. However, one month before it was carried out, Krista changed her mind at the last minute, filing a motion for her appeal to be reinstated. The execution was halted. Given the change of heart regarding her appeal, you'd think Krista would have been putting her best foot forward in prison, but this wasn't the case by any means. In 2001, with the assistance of another prisoner, she attacked and attempted to strangle fellow inmate Patricia Jones with a shoestring. Jones survived, but Krista was charged with attempted first-degree murder on August 12, 2004, earning her additional prison time. Four years later, in 2008, 32-year-old Krista requested a new trial, claiming her mental state had not been given appropriate and serious consideration during the original trial. The appeals court disagreed, and Krista was returned to death row in December of that year. In March 2012, she once again found herself on the wrong end of prison authorities. It was discovered that Krista Pike, now 36, had planned a prison escape, it involved the collusion of a correction officer and a New Jersey man with whom Krista had been corresponding. With such a high-profile prisoner involved, a full investigation into the foiled escape plot was conducted by the Tennessee Department of Corrections, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, and the New Jersey State Police. As violent as the crime was against Colleen Slemmer, it's still rare for a female, especially one as young as Krista Pike, to be sentenced to death. Given that women account for only 13% of those charged with murder in the U.S., and of those convicted, only 2% received the death penalty, the jury's decision in Pike's case raises multiple questions. Were there other factors that played into their decision? One jury member described Krista at trial as saying, quote, she had an angel's face and a devil's heart. This may illustrate the contention made by the Death Penalty Information Center that, quote, women who are sentenced to death are perceived as breaking gender norms, end quote. In other words, it's possible that Krista Pike received such a harsh sentence because women are stereotypically perceived as incapable of committing such violence. Did the jury view her as an inherently evil monster, regardless of her age or gender? Today, the law urges caution in how young people are sentenced, including how and when the death penalty is imposed. In 2018, the American Bar Association passed a resolution opposing the death penalty for individuals aged 21 or younger at the time of the offense. Had this been in place before 1996 when Krista Pike was arrested, her life would likely have been spared. Instead, she remains a rarity in the justice system, a dead woman walking, or less poetically stated, a woman on death row. But it's also unlikely that she will ever face the ultimate consequence and be put to death. Looking specifically at the state of Tennessee where Krista was convicted, only two inmates have been executed since 1960, 
both of them men. However, Krista Pike is not expected to ever walk free due to the extreme callousness of her crime and her record in prison. If her actions behind bars are considered, Krista hasn't done herself any favors by perpetrating violence on a fellow inmate and following that up with a failed escape plan. Today, Krista has exhausted all her appeals in the state of Tennessee. As of June 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to review her case. According to court records, in August of that year, the Attorney General's office requested a new execution date be set for Krista Pike. Her attorneys continue to work through the appeals process at the federal level in hopes of being granted a new trial or a chance at resentencing. Her current defense team, who claims Krista requires further comprehensive mental health assessment, argues it would be premature for the court to set a new execution date. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is looking into Krista Pike's case to determine whether her civil rights have been denied. Krista Gale Pike is currently being held at the Deborah K. Johnson Rehabilitation Center in Nashville, Tennessee. She is now 47 years old. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. To find out what I get up to all year long, follow me on social media. There are links to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. Did you know that Once Upon a Crime can also be found on YouTube? You can subscribe to our YouTube channel to listen to our episodes and watch accompanying videos. If you have friends who love true crime but aren't podcast listeners, share our YouTube channel with them. Just look for Once Upon a Crime podcast on YouTube. Make sure to put in Once Upon a Crime podcast. Hit the subscribe button and like and comment on the videos. And of course, share them with others. It would really help us out. Thank you so much. Once Upon a Crime is produced and edited by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My production and administrative assistant is Lorena Garcia. Research for this episode was provided by Emma Battaglia and was co-written by Gemma Harris. Until next time, be good to one another.